come and dream with me. Hello and welcome to What Do You Want to Watch? Six Pleasure Network's premier media podcast. Every week we get together and talk about movies, TV and online content. And help you answer the question, is Horizon an American saga related in any way to Yellowstone? No, they're two completely separate things. They just both star Kevin Costa. I'm your host, Ashley Hobley. Joining me today, Del Blight. Is this the thing that people are confused about? I saw one like Instagram person that I follow was like, "Oh, I didn't realize they were not related." I guess I can go see the ones like set, but like in Kevin Costa's day. character in Yellowstone's like set modern times, and Kevin yes. Costa's character in is set in, like the 1800s. Yeah. Like, I understand there's a Yellowstone spin-off spent set in the 1800s, but his mm-hmm. character's not that age. No. It's but they're both westerns, so... Yeah, they are, yeah. Cool. Do you know when Horizon's coming out? Uh, this month on Stan? It's coming out this Friday, Thursday. There <laughs> you go. And then it is coming to Stan on the 29th of... 26th Very of September. Very weird release. Uh... But yes. Actually, I Just think it's I... smart that they're going to release it on stand probably around that time because that's probably when the second one's going to come out in cinemas or not long after. Yeah, but like, why did the first one skip the cinemas? No, it's coming to cinemas Thursday. Oh, and stand at the same time. No, and then it's coming to stand in September. Oh, September. Right. Okay. The the news surround. No, they're just, they confuse me with how they're. I mean, if you look at look up the movie now, it says, oh, watch now on Stan. So. Yeah. So people are just going to think so it's a Google. Stan movie. And just go to not look for the cinemas. Because I thought it was a, I thought it was skipping cinemas in Australia. No. It's out this week. <laughs> okay. Surprise. Uh, on today's show, we'll be talking about what's our watch history. Can to give us the film news? Give us the thumbs of trailers and giving you this week's top three. Uh, King things off. Dylan, you went out to the cinema and watched. A quiet, the quiet place is it a quiet place? Day one, the prequel. Is it the quiet place or a quiet place? It's a quiet place. Okay. Um. Yeah. So this one is a prequel. It's directed by Michael Saranowski, the director of Pig, which is a fantastic film. Um. It's set day one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I got you there. Um, stars uh, Peter Nyong'o Ny- 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 uh, and uh, Joseph Quinn and uh, Alex Wolf was in it also. Um, but uh, I fall on the side of not thinking this is... Uh, I, I've seen even Buddy Watson be like, man, this movie is so good. Nah, it was pretty avo. Um, the, so it here's the problem with this movie. Straight straight off the bat. Like, I was... Right. I was it's... Like, it just doesn't have any interesting, like, here, here's what it does. It introduces a character, the pretty mm-hmm. known ghost character, uh, and it starts, and she's at a hospice. She's got cancer. She's dying. She's accepted she's dying, right? So straight away, it's like, the, the movie, like, does this whole di- idea. It's like, okay, if you're dying and the world's ending, like, what do you, you know, the whole, like, I've got nothing to live for anyway. Like, what would that sort of character do? So Ooh. she basically wants to get to a certain pizza place, um, which the movie explains ties back to like sentimental value for her, right? Mm-hmm. Um, along the way, she meets you know um, Joseph Quinn's character, who's you know just a normal dude trying to survive. Um, I think both of them give fantastic performances. I don't think they ever give those characters enough. Like, there's one particular scene like where they like. St- they they stay together somewhere after like uh, a bit you know running from these monsters for uh, for a bit and they like camp down somewhere and they have a really great scene where they like break down and sort of like very emotional it's very cool it's like a 10 minute sequence and then the next morning it's like back to running from monsters i think all the monster stuff ruins this movie like and almost feels like there's way too much monster stuff and i feel like there was less monster stuff in the original movie and probably even the sequel. Like this, it feels like there's like a lot of monster shit in this, and I really don't feel like it would have been Michael Sarantosi's idea. Choice. Like I know he wrote the script um, alongside John Krasinski and whatever the other dude who co-wrote it, his name is, because I know three of them. Um, but 
I just feel like it's almost like a studio mandate. And also, how much of the monsters were shown really pissed me off. Like, I know we, like, we sit in the first one. I mean, it's a is thriller. day one. <laughs> yeah, but the first one, it's a thriller. And, like, I like the, the mystery around it and whatever else. And, you know, and I know a lot of things piss me off about this movie. I'm going to be completely honest. The other thing that really annoys me is, so the first movie, because it's like, you know, it's set, I can't remember how long. It's like, you know, they've been, the, Krasinski family, we'll call them. They've, they've, well, you know, it's his real wife, so sure. Um, they've been surviving Not his real out. Kids, Not his real kids. Um, they've been surviving out. They've got a whole system, but it, you know, it's like a year into or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like after they've, they've got the their shit figured out. There's a scene. This maybe like when everything goes to hell. So because like they, so um, Lupita Nyong'o's character, this hospice is like sort of outside New York. I don't know. Like, you know, so there's a scene early in the movie where they get in a bus. They're like, we're going to go to a show in New York City. And they travel in a bus into the city. And the film makes it like even has like all these texts come up and tell you how New York City is like the loudest city in the world. and has an average decibel of whatever. Of course, it's going to attract the monsters. Right. Cool. But then it's like all the shit happens. The monsters come down. There's a there's like a, a you know, a sequence where they're trying to escape city. It's nowhere near as cool as like the, the car scene from A Quiet Place Part 2, IMO. Um, that was a lot more thrilling. But then they fucking Lupita Nyong'o's character walks back into this room and there's like, I don't know, 50 at least people in this room who have all within what seems like a half hour sequence all universally agreed and figured out that the monsters, they can only hear. Like they figured out in half an hour. I'm like, there is no fucking way in a world where people cannot agree that the fucking earth is uh, round. <laughs> these days right that 50 odd pe- random new yorkers within a half hour after an alien invasion are all like no don't fucking they fucking like i'm like no fucking way it bro- it broke me right there and then and we're like half an hour into this movie <laughs> you know like i'm like no nah, i don't i don't buy into this at all i don't know i feel like in any you know situation you would just be quiet you know if there was an active shooter or something, you would no, not but want to make any to, noise. To the degree that that like they know, you know, you tread on a tiny bit of broken glass, like the the tiniest bit of noise. They, yeah. They've apparently figured it all out, you know. They've, 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 like and fifty people have all like not not a single one of these motherfuckers goes. It's a conspiracy, you know. Like I, <laughs> I like I just don't fucking buy it at all. It really annoyed me. Um, and then. But then also the film does this thing where it, like it chooses what is and isn't too loud. And that also annoyed me because I thought it was very obvious from the past films that these things are like ultra fucking sensitive. Right. And the film at to- and this one at times plays into that and goes, yes, the monsters are ultra sensitive to sound. That's like the number one thing that, you know, they can't see ultra sensitive to sound. So then you'll have, but then there's also a scene where it's like, there's, a gr- hundreds of people walking to try to get to escape the city and they're sounding like a fucking marching band you know a hundred hundreds of people walking together and the film does a, a, a le- it shows you this as well like and he's like man they're fucking noisy i'm like yeah they're noisy like where are the monsters but it's not until someone like tri- trips over a, a fucking bottle or you know like i can't remember like that suddenly that's the setting up point i'm like no they were already loud enough i don't like it it just picks and chooses what rules are apparently okay to i I don't know it just it it, it's too much monsters too much too much also after the other films just do a lot of um you know like it's you hear you less seeing and more you know hearing or whatever you want to call it like less thriller and this movie just like suddenly treats them like normal alien monsters there's lots of close-up shots of them like growling in people's faces and we just see too much of them i'm like like there's a co- there's a good movie here. There's a good character story, and as I said, the acting's all great when it is. But then I was like, I'm gonna be honest. I was fucking bored. Like I was like the amount of like just running from monsters and like shit that uh, I was getting annoyed at them breaking the rules. I was like, this isn't actually that thrilling. Um, you know. I remember there was a scene where like they they like in the water and this monsters like fucking coming through the water for, and I'm just like sitting there going. How much long has this got left? I don't give a fuck anymore. Like, anyway, um, I was disappointed by this. I, I and I'm well aware I'm probably falling onto the the minority. I feel like it's fifty <laughs> fifty, maybe. Like okay. people really enjoying it, like got invested in the emotional story, and like 
uh, then there's you know people like you who are angry at everything. <laughs> Angry at everything. Every, I just... no, 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 no. <laughs> or didn't meet expectations or what you wanted from this movie. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's been interesting to see the reaction. Obviously, it did fantastically at the box office. Got the, Made the most money in the franchise history opening weekend. Mm. Um, so, you know, look forward to A Quiet Place Day 2. Coming soon. I hope not. Well, actually, no. They can't. Like, no, there's no, there's no. This whole movie, the only, uh, there's other weird thing where they like, um, what's it? Uh, Jimon Houston's character is in this, and he like shows up at the start of the movie, just because he's like there at the the show they go watch the puppet show, and he's like there at the end of the movie, and it's just like ah, remember him from A Quiet Place Two? Later, this is where he was. I was like, okay, cool, good job. I don't care. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I binge watched Abbott Elementary season three. Uh, very happy to report that they did drop the entire season rather than oh, eke you. it out week by week. Uh, so yeah, season three uh, is a very funny opening where uh, the camera crew uh, have been away for five months uh, because all their stuff got stolen <laughs> in the streets of Philadelphia. They got mugged and all the camera equipment got stolen, so they had to save up. So they've like, there's like a five month kind of time jump uh, in the first episode. Uh, and during that time period, uh, Janine has taken a job. Well, she's taken a fellowship with the district, uh, so she's not actually teaching at Abbott Elementary. She's like working for the I don't know the district with um, what's his name, Josh from She Hulk and uh. Uh, he, uh, Josh Shigar. Uh, so they're working, uh, you know, to bring programs to the different schools and that kind of stuff. Uh, so that kind of adds a different dynamic to the, you know, the the season where she's kind of away from like the day to day teaching and getting advice from people and kind of, you know, try ha- having a little conflicts with uh people because of the different role that she's in. Uh, yeah, really enjoyable season. Uh, you know, it's just I don't think it like there's not drastic changes. Um, you know, it's just the same characters that you know and love doing more of the same stuff. Uh, you know, dealing with how terrible the education system is. Uh, dealing with kids and their problems. Uh, one of the funniest through lines this season is uh Gregory has become the cool teacher that all the uh black young men young uh teenage students come and uh go to <laughs> they just hang out in his classroom uh and he's he's not good at giving the advice <laughs> you know uh but for some reason they all look up to him so you know uh he has to deal with that through the entire season um yeah lots of fun bits and pieces really enjoyable definitely worth a binge Abbott elementary is still really good uh, and then, so I've been sick this weekend, so I've watched Tracker. What, what do you got? It's cold. What did the weather drop to 22 and you got so cold? You yeah, got sure. Cold. Yeah. Yeah, so this, the whole season of Tracker dropped on City Plus. So it's a show that aired on CBS in America. It's a procedural show uh, starring Justin Hartley as Coulter Shaw a survivalist and tracker who earns his living by assisting law enforcement and private citizens in exchange for reward money. So what he, he calls himself a rewardist. And what he goes, he goes, he gets a bunch of tips from, uh, you know, these people. Um, and he goes out and like gets, earns reward money. Like if someone puts up 2000, oh, like 25 grand for a missing person, he'll go out and then track this person down. Um, based on a Jeffrey Diva novel series, uh, even though apparently none of the books are like directly adapted, it's just a concept mostly. It's fun, you know. Justin Hartley is a solid lead. Um, I mean, it's kind of preacher, uh, don't reach a light. <laughs> um, this is a survivalist, so he just travels from town to town. He's got like a camper van that he stays in. Uh, he's got like 
his different contacts. He's got like a lawyer friend who like comes in and helps him all the time, and like an analyst dude that like does all the phone hacking and that kind of stuff. Um, and then there's like a slight overall like mystery going on about his family history and his dad's what something about his dad, but it's very like it's very much on the back burner <laughs> and like addressed every now and then. And the episodes are definitely formulaic in a way. Uh, you know, you'll have the cold open where it's kind of like you get a bit of an insight into what the mystery of the person involved. And then, you know, he'll be successful because that's what this the show, this kind of show is. And then the, it'll just be him dry, leaving with like a, a like slightly, uh, I know, melodramatic song playing over the top. <laughs> You know, your basic procedural. Uh, but yeah, I mean, 13 episodes, it's a fun, you know, watch if you're sick and feel like binge watching something. Uh, yeah, I, I had a good time. You know, seeing him say rescue people. Why didn't you watch a bunch of random horror movies when you're sick like I do? We all have our own That's... different tastes, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? When you, <laughs> you watch a bunch of random horror movies, I generally watch like a bunch of junky action movies or something you know that's how i watched all those uh has fallen movies you know mm. Mm. yeah so that's what i watched um dylan last week i forgot to include this movie that you watched you watched the beekeeper i did. Want to hear your did thoughts on this jason statham movie i actually enjoyed it i thought it was fucking dumb ass but it was fun um <laughs> just the this uh there's like the part just, I don't know, something about Josh Hutchinson playing what I presume is supposed to be like a 20-year-old, like, tech kid when he's n- way too old to be playing that part. <laughs> and then just this lot of random casting in this movie, like mm-hmm. Mini Driver and Jeremy Irons and, like, a bunch of people in this that I'm like, how do you end up in this movie? <laughs> like, what is mm-hmm. going on? Um, and then, you know, you got Jason Statham just, like, seriously walking into rooms being like, You've disturbed the whole <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, it just falls into the 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 realm of weird weird setups that cause dude to go on rampage genre, you know? It's like he's an ex servant a secret agent. It's part of the beekeeper group, which we never really explained, but that's fine. I never really explained the secret organization in the first John Wick either. So they're like, nah, we'll just give you a little bit. It's secret. They, for some reason, use fucking ancient technology, even though the movie is obviously set in like modern 2020s somewhere, but they're on like fucking CT TVs or some shit like that. Makes no reason. And then he has like a flip phone or something. Absolutely makes no sense. Anyway. Then he's like, yeah, well, you fucking killed that old lady and you really you fucking... No, actually, she kills herself because they steal her money, these tech bros. You know, and there's a moral... I think there's a good moral to the story here. And then, you know, Jason Statham just goes and kills a bunch of people. And, you know, the action's pretty good. So, uh, yep. Yeah, that hallway fight towards the end. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, I think the trailer, back when I watched it, I was like, this looks dumb. Um, and you know what? I wasn't wrong. It is dumb, but it's fun. Yeah. It's a good time. Mm. Uh, all right. So I finished watching Game Chambers your season six. Have you finished watching the, the finale? Game- oh, no, I haven't. Fuck. Just spoil it. It's fine. So I'm going to run through my ranking for season six, Game Changer. So it was I'll eight live ranking. Give me the episodes yeah. as you go, and I'll fucking. I'll keep All right, there were eight there. episodes. Okay. This season, number eight, pencils down. Uh, this is like an art episode with a bunch of like, you know, I guess internet artists. Uh, where you know they have to do do fun drawing stuff. It's fine. I just my major complaint is I wish they'd given them more time for each segment. Can we, hold on. Can we, have we talked about the show before? Like, I don't know. Like. We've talked about the show before. So the concept of game changer is each episode is a different game, a different game show, you know, and the generally they don't know what they're about to play. Mm. So they have to figure out the rules of the game that they have to play while the game, while they're playing. It's on Dropout TV, which is, mm. I'm sure everybody's, it's, it's, 
Dropout, I feel like, has gotten a weird, res- like, uh, incredible word of mouth over the last 12 months. Well, post uh, post this season releasing, they would they have, like, Sam Reich had a... I mean, they're doing a very he- heavy Emmy push this year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, a lot of interviews with, like, uh, like Deadline and Variety yeah. and that kind of stuff. And, like, uh, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, if you haven't heard of Game Changer... There's some free episodes available on YouTube. You can watch those. Um, and then, you know, you pay a subscription to get all the the good stuff. Uh, but yeah, my number eight, Pencils Down. It's it's fine. But, you know, I feel like it, it just needed a little bit more uh, work. Uh, my number seven is Deja Vu, which is an episode in which uh, there is a time loop. <laughs> And they have to keep, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, basically it boils down to being a memorization game. Um, I mean, it's fun. It's fine. But, uh, once you know what the loop is, it's like, okay, how many times are we going to have to sit through these, these same bits, I guess. Um, my number six, second place, first episode of the season. Uh, where the goal is to earn second place at all the challenges. Uh, was a fun little... Um, they have, like, little actual... Uh, like, uh, trying to do game shows. Uh, or uh, parody game shows. Like, they've got a, a, a deal or no deal. No, it's do or no do. Yep. Uh, and then, you know... I mean, Brandon has a great uh, monologue at the end. Which uh, helps the, the episode, and there's some funny bits in there, in which uh, someone wins a Lord of the Rings uh, original box set, despite never having read or had any interest in the Lord of the Rings, uh, which is enjoyable. Uh, number five, the newly webs game, uh, which is three couples uh, who give their phones away <laughs> to be scoured through, uh, and then they have to answer questions about what phone usage their partner has so the newly wed game but with modern technology uh and that kind of stuff so asking how much their partner is using on um you know uh doordash and stuff like that or how long they spend on the different apps or what message what stuff in the notes is like what does it mean there are some wild reveals uh really fun uh you know lots of fun banter just a good uh, cast in this one. So that's my number five. Uh, number four is Beat the Buzzer, which is a really creative episode where uh, there each buzzer only works once. They have to find a bunch of buzzers around <laughs> the studio, which are hidden or have to be activated in amusing and creative ways. Um, and then they have to answer very simple questions, uh, if they can remember what the questions are. Uh, really creative. The art team did a fantastic job on this episode. Um, and, you know, it, the, you know, the, the cast for this one was really g- good as well and sold the premise. Uh, number three is Bingo, in which, uh, the cast on stage have to try and earn bingo balls, uh, by reacting like playing out different prompts, that kind of stuff. But then there's extra layers on top that are revealed through the course of the episode that I won't spoil. Um, yeah, really interesting one that as the, the reveals go along, uh, just adds to the enjoyment. Number two is Ratfish. The season finale, which is a parody of The Circle, which I've never so seen. Um, but I got the, the... Got the idea, and they set up an interesting premise where it's... Eight players trying to catfish each other, uh, but they've their goal is to figure out who is playing who. Uh, but maybe the there's a secret person involved. <laughs> uh, really fun, a lot of interesting characters, um, uh, lots of jokes and banter, and like trying to because obviously this is uh, they've got a very similar crew that comes in every single time. They've got a, a, a rotation of comedians that you know that. They're familiar with and that kind of thing. Uh, so they can, there's a lot of fun guessing as to who's playing who and, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. 
So that's that's a really good episode. I feel it, I, it was very close to being number one. I just feel like the it doesn't quite end in a super satisfying way. Uh, sorry to say before you have watched that episode, uh, but you've had like three weeks. Uh, my number one episode of C- Game Changers season six. Sam says three. So this is the third iteration of Sam says. It's a very simple premise. It's like Simon says. Sam said when Sam says to do something, you do it. And if you don't, if you if you do something when Sam doesn't say Sam says, you know you lose a point. Simple game for children, but it's a terror. It's an incredible psychological war against these contestants, uh, in which he messes with them in incredible ways. Uh, the introduction of a swear jar is very amusing. Um, obviously the third iteration, so they've kind of upped the ante each, every time. Um, and yeah, incredible payoff. Uh, and yeah, just some of the psychotic breaks in this, uh, some of the best you'll see on Game Changer. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's my ranking of season six of Game Changer. What, have you done a quick ranking? Yes. I've included right. Ratfish currently based on watching part okay. one, but not two. That's my asterisk. All right. So, number eight, Pencils Down, same as you. Mm-hmm. Number seven, Deja Vu, same as you, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I'll go uh, six, Ratfish. Okay. Currently based on where I'm at. Uh, five, Second Place. Four, Bingo. Three, Beat the Buzzer. Two, The Newlyweds Game. And one, Sam Says Three. Okay. Any shocking revelations there? Shocking revelations. <laughs> uh, so yeah, are you, are you going to go through the backlog of Game Changer episodes? Yeah, I want to. I've watched like what the first. Um, I've watched like, well, I went back and watched all the time as uh, Sam says. So yeah. and then I've watched like the first four episodes of season one. Okay. I think so, it was only like four episodes. Since... <laughs> okay, so maybe I've watched all season one then. <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> so yeah go check that out uh support dropout tv they just started the new season to make some noise which is a spin-off of the make some noise game changer episodes and they've got uh, that thing up i want to watch too the stand-up stuff yeah actually that reminds me i did watch the hank green special mm. uh i think it's pissing out cancer yeah something uh, like that. in which he kind of talks about his cancer experience um mm. Really good, uh, tight, 40 minutes, something like that. Um, really well delivered, some interesting points. I think, you, I don't know if it will work for people who don't know who Hank Green is. I think you just need like a a basic understanding, maybe like read a Wikipedia article about who he is, um, but then you're good to go. Uh, but yeah, they're doing a bunch of specials, they're launching a bunch of stuff. Well, I mean, uh, he's never done stand-up before, as far as I that's his... Like, no, I think he was, he started doing this show for a while though, yeah. Uh, yeah. but it finally did a recording of it. So, yeah, check that out. Um, so I watched a documentary that's currently screening on Netflix. Hate to love Nickelback. So it's a documentary about the careers of Nickelback from the early starting in like basic like a. Uh, like a very rural, uh, you know, simple town. Uh, it's becoming the biggest rock act uh, of the new century, I'd argue. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a solid biopic or a music documentary about their, you know, rise, their early days starting um, and like uh, that kind of stuff. I think the most interesting stuff to a lot of people will be like the point in which people started to turn on them <laughs> uh, and how they kind of reacted to a lot of the hate that like, uh, they get. <laughs> um, they've got a lot of footage of like uh, a lot of jokes from stuff and how a lot of mentions of Nickelback and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, but, you know, uh, they also include a very long clip from Once Upon a Deadpool <laughs> in which Deadpool breaks down all the facts as to why Nickelback is not terrible. Like, all the albums have sold, all the awards have won, all the, all this kind of stuff. I don't think I've ever watched that. No, me neither. I don't, 
because this is uh, Deadpool recounting the story of Deadpool two, yeah, two to uh, Fred Savage, Prince of Princess Bride style. Um, it's fine, you know. I'm not. I don't have strong feelings either way about Nickelback. Obviously, you know, at their height, they're on the radio all the time. I feel like that's probably why. I don't have strong. I don't have strong feelings. You know, the thing that annoys me though is I generally think they're shit, right? But not in a meanie way. <laughs> and it annoys me that like if I say that Nickelback shit, people like like I fall into the camp of um like meme hating. I'm like, no, I just think they're bad. Like I just don't think I don't like any of their songs. But not in a meme way. I'm like, can I not just say Nickelback shit? The same as I could say any other band shit without being like, man, you're such a hater. I'm like, I'm not being a hater. I'm just telling you that you asked what I thought of Nickelback and I said they're shit. <laughs> like, can you, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but then you like see them playing, still playing to uh, crowds of like thousands of people. Uh, yeah, good massive, for them. massive crowds. So. They're, they've got the audience, and I think they've come to the point where they're like, oh, we're just playing Nickelback songs to people who are like, we talk about Nickelback. We don't need, we've got a large enough audience that we don't need to try and get more people in, you know? Um, and that's kind of found comfort for them. Uh, they talk about some of the medical struggles they've had during the years, including one of the band members, like, had a full stroke, like, in the studio and, like, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, interesting watch. Um, you know, I guess you won't like it if you don't have a, at least some sort of appreciation or nostalgia for Nickelback songs or music. Um, so you're probably not going to watch it. So probably yeah. not. No. Uh, Hate to Love Nickelback is streaming on Netflix at the moment. Uh, and then the only other thing I watched was uh, an anime. So Dylan, you can you know rest up. Write some notes, because uh, I'm going to be talking about some anime. Actually, so, you know. uh, so I've binged through the latest, the first season of Kaiju number eight. Uh, so it flows a, it's set in a world in which Kaiju are constantly attacking. So there is a, uh, the anti Kaiju defense force uh, in Japan that's set up to like a Godzilla, Godzilla rep, monster burst rip off. I mean, Kaiju are all the things, you know. Uh, yeah, so there's, we follow, uh, Kafka Hibino, who is a, you know, 31 year old man who wanted to become part of the defense force, but, you know, constantly failed the, the crew recruitment tests, uh, and is instead working in Kaiju, uh, uh, waste management. So it's their job to, after they've defeated the Kaiju, Cut up the kaiju <laughs> and get take them, get rid of their bodies and that kind of stuff, um, you know. Um, but then one day they get attacked by like a random kaiju that pops out of one of the massive kaiju, um, and after being rescued and being taken to the hospital, he gets a kaiju inserts itself into his body and he becomes like a humanoid kaiju thing. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So he's got control over his body and everything, but he's got kaiju powers and can transform into like a kaiju. Uh, That's both worlds then. So then his good idea is, hey, I'm going to use this and I'm going to join the defense force. Uh, a group of people who will shoot any kaiju on site. Uh, and the, doc- the the season follows his uh, quest to become part of the defense force. It's a very enjoyable documentary. Uh, documentary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny it could be a documentary uh, <laughs> very fun anime uh, some fun fight sequences uh, you know there is the crazy uh, anime aspect of like people shouting out the moves they're about to do uh, so if you're not a fan of that this isn't going to be for you but you know um, yeah but everyone's watching Dragon Ball Z yeah uh, no but it's One like piece. Super mega slice second style and that kind of style stuff. Um, yeah, really good season. I just kind of wish the the mystery had maybe been explored a little bit more. They kind of left it off in like an interesting point um, that you know there's still a lot of questions, uh, but you know they've just been greenlit for a second season. 
Um, so yeah, Kaiju number eight. It's as good as people have been saying it is. Right, that's everything in our watch history. Let's move into some film news, I guess. There's not a lot no, this week. I want to give you some news, which is that I plan to soon start watching that anime, Dead Dead Demons, Dead Dead, 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 Dead Destruction. Yeah? Yep. Why? Because I like it. I like the look of it. I thought it looked cool. Okay. Fuck off. Leave me alone. Why can't I just say I want to watch something? You're like, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> what was what drew you in? That's all, you know? I watched the trailer. I was like, this looks pretty cool. Okay. We'll look forward to you talking about it when Fuck you get, figure me out right. how I'm to like, I want to watch it. an anime. You're like, oh, you're not allowed to watch anime. Anime is mine, Kieran's thing. You're not allowed to watch anime. I never said any of those things. So pretty, like so fucking <laughs> judgmental, right? Uh very quiet week this week, you know, but every week there's always some casting or acquisition news. So we like to cover a lot of these smaller news stories in a segment we like to call Would You Want to Invest? So I'll give details about a different project to Dylan and he will tell me if he would want to partially invest not invest or fully invest in the project, and then history will be the judge of his. History will be the judge if he is right or wrong. Are uh, you ready for this installment, Dylan? I'm always ready. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Julianne Moore, Megan Fahey, and Millie Alcock have been set to top line Netflix Sirens, a female driven dark comedy limited series created by Emmy nominated writer and showrunner. Molly Smith Meltzer from Maid. Uh, an adaptation of Meltzer's play Elimino P, which she wrote at the Juilliard School, the show centers on Devon, who still who thinks her sister Simone has a really creepy relationship with her new boss, the enigmatic Michaela Kell. Michaela's cultish life of luxury is like a drug to Simone, and Devon has decided it's time for an intervention. When Devon tracks her sister down to say what the fuck, she has no idea what a formidable opponent that Michaela will be. Todd, over the course of one explosive weekend on the Kells lavish beach estate, the show is billed as an incisive, sexy, and darkly funny exploration of women, power, and class. Yeah, I fully invest. I like the I like um, everyone involved and the idea. I'll let you read about this up, Bobby. So usually I fully invest in things that I know about before you bring them up in this fucking segment. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Brianna Middleton has been tapped as the co-lead opposite Callum Turner in Neuromancer, Apple TV Plus's new sci-fi drama based on the award-winning novel by William Gibson. Created, by TV, created for TV by Graham Rowland and J.D. Dillard, Neuromancer follows a damaged top-rung super hacker named Case, who is thrust into a web of digital espionage and high-stake crime with his partner Molly, a razor girl assassin with mirrored eyes, aiming to pull a heist on a corporate dynasty with untold secrets. That sounded like some anime shit to me. That's not going to work. I'm not investing. Wow. Because I hate anime. Well... Uh, Will Forte is the latest cast addition to Netflix's The Four Seasons, joining as a season regular in the comedy series based on the Universal 1981 feature film. He joins fellow series, series yeah. he joins fellow series regulars Tina Fey, Steve Carell, Coleman Domingo, Erica Henningsen, and Kerry Kenny Silver. Details on their roles are being kept under wraps. The Four Seasons is co-created by Thirty Rock creator and star Fey. And the 30 Rock alums, Lang Fisher and Tracy Wingfield. Uh, the four seed. Uh, 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 nope, that's it. <laughs> yep. All right. So, n- no, I'm not investing. In fact, you okay. had to do a. Dun, 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 you're looking for something more? No, I'm out. I thought there would be a description. No. Nope. Uh, here, let me look up the film. No, that's it. Dude, no, there's no trying to save it. <laughs> All right. Sorry, the four seasons. Yeah, no, stop them. Uh, Peyton Elizabeth Lee has wrapped the lead role has wrapped the lead role in Carved, a comedy horror comedy produced for Hulu Originals by Wyvern Books, uh, which will premiere exclusively on Hulu later this year. 
directed by up and cover uh justin harding from his script written with cheryl myers carved is based on the 2018 short of the same name written and directed by harding for hulu's bite-sized halloween the story is about a heartbroken teenage playwright her young brother and a group of survivors who become trapped in a historical reenactment village on halloween night and must band together to survive a relentless attack by a sentient and vengeful pumpkin Yep, I'm fully investing. Sounds great. <laughs> That's totally in my sort sort of shit. I figured it would be. <laughs> uh, Rosemary DeWitt is set to star opposite Eric Banner in Netflix's limited series Untamed for Warner Brothers Studios and studio based John Wells Productions. Written by L- Mark L. Smith and Ellie Smith, Untamed is a character driven mystery thriller that follows Kyle Turner, a special agent for the National Park Service who works to enforce human law in nature's vast wilderness. The investigation of a brutal death sends Turner on a collision course with the dark secrets within the park and his own past. In addition to Banner, DeWitt joins previously cast Sam Neill. Oh, partial verse for Sam Neill. All right. With Sony Pictures' Bad Boys Ride or Die passing the $100 million Box, domestic box office mark this past weekend. The studio and Will Smith are already looking to the future as he's attached to star in Sony's Resistor. Based on the book Influx by best-selling author Daniel Suarez, first draft of the script was written by Zach Olowitz with Eric Warren Singer penning the latest draft. Uh, the pick will be produced by Todd Black, Jason Blumthor, Steve Titch, and Tony Shaw of Escape Artists. We've been developing the project for some time, along with Smith and John Morn through Westbrook. While details are under wraps, the 2014 novel is a sci-fi thriller that follows physicist John Grady and his team who have discovered a device that can reflect gravity, a triumph that will revolutionize the field of physics and change the future. But instead of a claim, Grady's lab is locked down by a covert organization known as the Bureau of Technology Control. The Bureau's mission, suppress the truth of sudden technology progress and prevent the social upheaval it would trigger. Because the future is already here, and its rewards are only for a select few. When Grady refuses to join the BTC, he's thrown into a nightmarish high-tech prison housing other doomed rebel intellects. Now is the only hope to usher humanity out of its artificial dark age, Grady and his fellow prisoners must try to expose the secrets of an unimaginable enemy, one that wields a technology advantage half a century in the making. Um, do you know what that was making me think of? That was making me think of Silo. Yeah, a little bit. Like the plot, like the suppressed technology, because it could. Ooh. Um, I'll go partial on this. Yeah. Patrick Brabel, co-creator and star of Breakout Australian Comedy, colon for from accounts, is swapping laughs for a white knuckle thriller. Brabel is starring in a series adaptation of Ryan David Jahn's book The Dispatcher for Apple TV+. Plus. The six-part series comes from Chris Merska. Uh, Brabber will play police detective Ian Hunt, whose life fell apart about 10 years ago when his young daughter Maggie disappeared without a trace. Now working as a police dispatcher, the only thing that has kept him going is his implacable refusal to accept that she is gone forever. When he receives a distress call from a young girl, he is certain as Maggie, he will stop at nothing to find her and reunite his broken family, whatever the cost. Um, I can't picture it, but sure, fully invest. <laughs> I've only ever seen yeah. him in comedies, I guess. So, mm. what comedians can't be dramatic? No, but all right. After seeing Cor Jefferson win the adapted screenplay Oscar for his work on American fiction, the wildly acclaimed adaptation of his 2001 novel Eraser, author Percival Everett has set up his latest book, James, at Universal Pictures, with Taika Waititi in talks to direct. Did I can confirm. A Pulitzer Prize finalist, Everett will adapt the screenplay and executive produce alongside Steven Spielberg and Emily Partners. A modern reimagining of Mark Twain's classic Adventures of Huckleberry Finn Published by Double Down in Double Day in March, James watches as an enslaved Jim overhears that he is about to be sold to a man in New Orleans, meaning that he'll potentially be separated from his wife and daughter forever. 
Subsequently, he decides to hide on near- nearby Jackson Island until he can formulate a plan. Meanwhile, Huck Finn has staged his own death to escape his violent father, recently returned to town. Uh, thus begins the dangerous and transcendent journey by raft down the Mississippi River towards the elusive and too often unreliable promise of the free states and beyond. I'm going to pass on this just because Tiger's on a, he's on a, he's out of my full hit territory. Okay. Uh, Amazon MGM Studios have landed. Are you see brains? Now I eat kale. A zombie feature package based on the same name adventure comedy short story from Adam and Daniel Cooper, aka the Cooper Twins. The story is set in a post-apocalyptic world. Oh no, it's set in a post-post-apocalyptic world where former zombies struggle to reintegrate. Ryan Gosling and Jesse Henderson will produce the film under their first look deal, first look deal with the studio through recently launched banner General Admission. Uh. When the insiders Jeff Snyder broke the news of the package earlier this month, it was reported that Gosling is also attached to Star, who told there's no truth to the assertion and there's no casting attachments that have been made. Coopers will script the feature adaptation. Um, Part on this? Alright. Last one for this week. Sony Pictures Classics have acquired worldwide rights to Blue Moon, the new film from Academy Award nominee Richard Linklater, on which he, we will first report, and which we will which will be his next effort after all, with production commencing in Dublin Island this summer. Ethan Hawke is set to star in his ninth collaboration with Linklater. Others aboard for roles include Margaret Qualley, Bobby Carnavale, and Andrew Scott. According to Linklater, who'd previously handed the long-time passion project with Hawke, Robert, Ethan, and I have been developing this story for over a decade and are excited and grateful that the time has come to bring this to life. Uh, written by Robert Kaplow, author of the novel Me and Orson Welles, which, in, which inspired the Linklater film of the same name, Blue Moon profiles the final days of Lorenz Hart, part of the hit songwriting team Rogers and Hart. The film is set primarily in Sardi's restaurant on March 31st, 1943, the opening night of Oklahoma, which marked Rogers' first collaboration with Oscar Hammerstein, the second as Hart's replacement. Yeah, fully advanced, obviously. Link later. Interesting. You didn't need, yeah, I, I was in fully investing at that point. Oh, yeah, I, I figured. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I guess we'll wait and see if uh, Dylan's right or wrong, but let's talk about some movies that may be a little bit closer by giving some thumbs to trailers. Of course, combine all the trailers we're about to talk about in the show notes below. Uh, kicking things off, we've got Heretic, directed by Scott Beck and Brian Woods, starring Hugh Grant, Chloe East, and Sophie Thatcher. When two Mormon missionaries attempt to convert a man, it turns out to be far more dangerous than they could have anticipated. Dylan, what would you think of the trailer from the writers of A Quiet Place? I loved it. That was great. Um... I think the casting's funny. <laughs> what, Hugh Grant? Yeah, to see him playing this evil sort of dude, it's quite funny. Um, His career has taken a real turn since Paddington 2. Yeah, Paddington 2. is like, do you want to play a villain? And he was like, I'll give it a go. And here he is, now playing a, you know, in a horror movie. Um, <laughs> obviously, Sophie Thatcher, I'm a fan of, because Jello Jackets. Um... Yeah, I don't. I don't really understand what. Not it's not a bad thing. I don't really understand what the what's happening. <laughs> like <laughs> they're, they're being tested. Does he purposely just test every fucking Mormon that like comes to his door? I don't know. Like what's the what's going on? Um, but I'm all for it. I think the trailer's great. Like from the, like I clicked play in this trailer without knowing anything about it. I just popped up one morning. It said Heretic A24. I was like, cool. All right, press play. Um. You know, and I found out as it went along, and I was like, yep, cool, that's great, never heard of it, let's go. So, double thumbs up. Uh, Yeah, I'll give it two thumbs up, I think it's a well-constructed trailer that does not give much away, and like, I mean, it gives the setup uh, very well. <laughs> mm. uh, there's these two moment girls just trying to, like, convert people uh, very unsuccessfully, and then when the one person uh, takes them in wolf- uh, gleefully, um, you know, they turn up a terrible person. 
Uh, the moral of the story, people don't want to convert it, and the people who do are probably terrible people. Yeah, that's the moral of the story, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I've no interest in seeing it, but, you know, it's a World Construction trailer. You know, it, it, do you, what do you got against you, Grant? Uh, uh, you know. I have no interest in mazes. Uh, Aerotech is coming to cinemas on the 21st of November. Next trailer. Red One. Directed by Jake Kasdan. Starring Dwayne Johnson. Chris Evans, Keenan Shipka, Lucy Liu, Mary Elizabeth Ellis, J.K. Simmons, Nick Kroll, and Christopher Hivju. Uh, when a villain kidnaps Santa Claus from the North Pole, an elf, extremely large and formidable, operative joins forces with the world's most accomplished tracker to find him and save Christmas. Tell them, what do you think of the trailer for this Christmas movie? Uh, I'm going double thumbs down. I think that it's a fun idea that um i'm watching the trailer going chris evans yep sure jk simmons whatever yep sure um and the just the casting of J- the rock Dwayne johnson ruins everything for me i just think he's it's like a fun idea where it's just the rock being the rock in another movie that even though it's about santa claus just looks like every other action movie he ever does and he's just playing this exact same character and i'm i'm kind of sick of it i'm i'm drawing my line i have one up one down i mean it looks like it'll be a fun christmas movie uh, you know, I haven't turned on the rock as much <laughs> yet. Um, although even Chris Evans, it seems like his, this is another role that's very similar to the other, uh, streaming ones he's been doing lately, like the, the ghosted similar mm. character, I guess, uh, and the, the gray man, I guess he was a little bit darker in that one, but you know, the implication is a bad guy. Mm. You know, he's just playing bad guys now. Because you play the ultimate good guy. Um, yeah, I mean, it looks fine. You know, Krampus is in there. Got the snowman. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll be fun, but it's definitely not going to be memorable. And we'll be likely talking about it on our podcast, A Very Explosion Over Christmas, where we talk about mm-hmm. Christmas movies later this year. So look forward to that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Because Red One comes to cinemas the 14th of November. Uh, next trailer is Here, directed by Robert Zemeckis, starring Tom Hanks, Robin Wright, Paul Petney, Kelly Riley, and Michelle Dockery. Multiple generations of couples and family inhabit the same home over the course of a century. So, what are your thoughts on the trailer for Here? Um, I'm going one up, one down. I don't love the trailer. I don't love the whole like weird setup with dinosaurs and all that sort of stuff and the big lingering. Robert Zemeckis always has these things. Every movie he puts out every couple of years always has to waste fucking 30 seconds, I feel, all these trailers being like, from the director of, let me list all the fucking movies I've done. Um, it, it annoys me. Um, the, the idea of the movie I like, you know, just, I guess, all being within this one room and families passing through and whatever else, it, it has the potential to be a really interesting um like character piece but i feel like the the, the movie is going to fall heavily onto this technology de-aging and all that sort of stuff and be more worried about that than telling a good story and then it's just going to fall apart so um i'm going one up one down yeah i'm kind of there with you one up one down um interesting concept i don't mind that you know the setup like clearly they're just going to fast forward through the dinosaurs Segment. No, they're the going concept... to show the dinosaurs making coffee in that same room, and you know, <laughs> yeah, morning, the honey. one patch of land, you know, yeah. Um, so the concept is the camera is going to be still in the one spot the entire movie. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, which, as someone pointed out, funnily, is what a play is. Uh, <laughs> so mm-hmm. we got to have all these people like doing things in the exact same spot throughout whatever hundred years, or whatever. Um, I mean, it makes the de aging technology probably better because they it's a steady locked camera the entire time, right? <laughs> you know, I don't yeah, know. Looks... They're moving. They're going to be at different angles. Like, there's going to be different, uh, you know, depths of view and that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, apparently, it's based on like a comic strip, which kind of did a similar like all the all the panels are like the same shot, I guess, mm. in the strip. It's not exactly the same as this, but you know. That's the idea behind it, I guess, or the inspiration. 
I'll say um, like the synopsis where it's like the story travels through generations, capturing human experience in its purest form. I saw a film that did that really well. It's called Boyhood. Yeah, I mean the, that's the one that's kind of draw instant comparison. I feel like just because it's like a time thing. Um, yeah, there's definitely an uncanny valley kind of thing about uh, watching Robin Wright and Tom Hanks. I mean, they got mm-hmm. Tom Hanks' pair right from that time period. The young yeah. Pair. Um, I, I I honestly feel like Zemeckis's downfall over the, the years, because um, I don't think he makes good movies anymore. Like, hmm. full stop. Um, his downfall has been obsession with technology over story. Yeah. And this, I, I, and that's exactly why I feel like this is going to fall into the same realm. same trap. Yeah. Like if I if I look back at his movie history, let's let me draw a line. Castaway. That's it. Two thousand. Everything past two thousand is more about technology rather than storytelling. Cool. Because everyone loves that. He always loves to flash around, like from the guy who did, yeah, you know, who framed Roger Rabbit, Back to the Future, um, Forrest Gump, of course. It's like, okay, yes, all those movies had cool technology, but the reason everyone loves them it isn't actually any of the technology stuff. Did flight have a massive technology thing? Yeah, it's about the fucking plane landing in the river and whatever and how they shot it or what, I don't know. But, you mm. know, and then you've got Beowulf and Christmas Carol and The Walk was all about the uh, the making it this massive IMAX experience or whatever. Yeah. I know. Yeah, it's just, yeah. I know, I feel like the smarter decision would have been to just go with younger actors and then, you know, mm-hmm. make up. <laughs> you know, or film it uh, over like a 20-year period. Or like film it over like a 100-year period <laughs> in which you, you can get all the action shots and that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, But yeah, I mean, we'll, I guess we'll wait and see. But yeah, it is very def- hard to watch. It definitely, you know, it looks animated at certain points. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yes, here... It's coming to cinemas on the 15th of November. Next trailer is for My Old Ass, directed by Megan Park, starring Maisie Stella, Percy Hines, White, Maddie Ziegler, uh, Kiersey Brooks, and Audrey Plaza. Aubrey Plaza. Uh, a mushroom trip brings three furious, free-spirited Elliot face-to-face with their 39-year-old self. But when Elliot's old ass delivers warnings to her younger self, Elliot realizes she has to rethink everything about her family, life, and love. Dylan, what did you think of the trailer for? My old ass. Um, I'm going to give the trailer one up one down simply because I, I feel like it, it confused me. Like it starts, and I like even though I understood she's talking to her older self, I I, I it was like I blinked and I'm like, how's this happening? And I was like, I'm maybe the trailer's not Drugs. trying to spoil it, but it just yeah, but it just it, <laughs> it like yeah, it just that part sort of annoyed me like just from a, a trailer perspective um I, why didn't you I'm tell looking... me exactly why things are happening <laughs> no it just it just felt weird the trailer just felt weird um i'm i'm excited to watch this movie though i i like the cast the love audrey Plaza and everything she's in um the director megan park did fallout which i thought was fantastic and um this like and that is a film about just mostly and very different subject matter but that that's about like people connecting post uh, a, a school shooting but the film falls into just two young girls like talking for a lot of it and like connecting on whatever Ooh. else and this is it looks similar but in a bit in a different sort of way um so i'm I'm keen for it but i'm gonna give the trailer one-on-one now i have two thumbs up i i didn't have any distractions or but maybe that's also i remember what the movie was or like Obviously I didn't, I didn't know what Sundance. the movie was. Yeah, I, yeah. I click playing the trailer, and I'm I'm discovering as I'm watching it what the trailer, like the yeah. movie is. Yeah, so that that may have helped me to a certain degree. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it looks like a lot of fun. Looks like a really good coming of age uh, film. Um, and I enjoyed how they brought the film title back into the into the trailer. Um, with a weird question, would you make out with yourself? <laughs> No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I get more of a question for bisexuals or gay people, I guess. To me. My own last kind of I still feel like it's weird. <laughs> 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 uh, 
My old ass coming to cinemas 26th of September. Uh, last trailer for this week. Nosferatu. Uh, directed by Robert Eggers. Uh, starring Bill Skarsgård, Nicholas Holt, Lily Rose Depp, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Emma Corrin, Ralph Innocent, Simon Big Bernie, and Willem Dafoe. A gothic tale of obsession between a haunted young woman and the terrifying vampire infatuated with her, causing untold horror in its wake. Dylan, what did you think of trailer four, Nosferatu? Double thumbs up, can't wait, it looks amazing. 10 out of 10, movie of the year. Wow, ball claimed. Uh, yeah, I'll give it two thumbs up as well. I think, you know, uh, we all had high expectations of this one. Um, you know, looks incredible. They, they have done a really cool job of like recreating, you know, Victoria and England, like, or like that era of, yeah, uh, the time period or whatever. There's some fucked up imagery, including a guy in a pigeon. Um, Pitch but then we, oh. uh, we don't ever actually see, you know, Nosferatu, the title yeah, character. Good. It's crazy. You know, Teaser crazy trailer. setting up kind of Willem Dafoe as like the major, major character in this. Um, Nosferatu. Yeah. It looks incredible. Uh, even though it looks like it's already tinged, I, I feel like I'm going to have to force myself to go watch it. Uh, <laughs> you know? Just keep that rugged Eggert's trade going, I guess, you know. We've watched the rest, so. That's true. I've still got, I've got Nosferatu sitting here. I need to watch. What? This it's not out till. Oh, sorry. Really First of January, twenty twenty five. How do you have it already? I've got the the original nineteen twenties one sitting here. Mm. I need to watch. That makes more sense. With one of, with what is considered one of the scariest scenes ever, which I've watched out of like out of context for the full film, but. All right. Uh, all right. Let's do this week's top three. Definitely in the top three. In this week's can top I, three. Can I, can, I, can I just add that to it? It's like, you, before I explain what top three is, I just want to say that looking at this list, I was like, hot take. Don't feel like the first half of 2024 has been that hot on movies. Anyway, say what the top three is. This week's top three is top three 2024 movies we've missed so far. I feel like maybe you're right. And also, there's an element of, I feel like we've watched most of the good stuff, so. Yeah, I feel like when we did this last, last year, year, around the same time, I had a lot more. Or more mm-hmm. standouts. Now, this could yep. be caused by multiple things. Maybe I have just been doing a bad job of watching everything that's worth watching and coming out. Mm-hmm. Or, probably the answer is, ride a strike, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just been myself, yeah. <laughs> uh, honestly, also in my list, I've included stuff that hasn't been really. Oh, no, I've left off stuff that I haven't been able to see. Like, you know. So um, my list is stuff like, that has been released in Australia that mm-hmm. I could be watching right now, now. <laughs> either in the cinema or digitally. Um, that I just yeah. haven't because not stuff that's been released elsewhere and not stuff that is released in America but not out in Australia. Yes. Yeah. All right. So Dylan, what's your number three? My number three is Robot Dreams. Um, mm. The animated film uh, that I don't think came to cinemas here. Maybe it did, definitely didn't come out here. Anyway, Lo- it's out on um, Blu-ray. Oh, sorry, DVD probably because mm. fucking physical media <clears throat> sucks ass. Um, and um, digital as of this week. So, Good choice. That's a good movie. Uh, my number three is Which Brings Me to You. We talked about the trailer. Uh, earlier in the year, uh, romantic comedy, I guess, where two people meet for the first time and then talk out all through their past relationships while like going through the memories and like playing it out at the same time. Looks like a fun time. Why don't you watch uh, this while you're sick? This sounds like an exact no, s- sick No, I might even watch this after I finish rec- this recording session. Mm. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's playing on Amazon Prime. Didn't get around to watching it, uh, but I'm keen to. Dylan, what's the number two? My number two is uh, How to Have Sex, which I've been wanting to watch for a while and I still haven't got around to. Which I know every time I say this high title, you go, oh, it's, it's a, a fun title. title. Yeah, it's a fun title. Um, but it's, but it's a, a very messed up story. Well, it's just like 
from my understanding, like falls into a genre that I sort of like, which is, I guess, dark dramas of young adults discovering life or something like that. I don't know. Yeah. You know, sort of that's if that's a genre. Um, but yeah, from my understanding, it's very good, well acted, well shot, you know, sort of um, British as well, as I believe. Uh, yeah, I'm keen to watch it. It has been out for a couple months now. I just haven't got around to it yet. Mm. Uh, my number two is Lisa Frankenstein. So this one didn't get an Australian release uh, in cinemas, but has been on digital for a little while yes. now. It's on my Apple TV uh, watch list. Yeah, uh, directed by Zelda Williams, uh, but written by Diablo Cody, uh, and follows a young woman who builds a boyfriend for herself from a cube, a corpse. The dream. The dream. Uh, yeah, got solid word of mouth, didn't perform fantastically at the box office. Uh, seems like my kind of humor <laughs> with just enough horror, just enough. To be acceptable. To, to be acceptable, you, yes. Yeah. Dylan, what's your number one? My number one's The Promised Land. Uh, Mads Mikkelsen's re-team up with... Um, fuck. Nikolai something or other. Anyway. Um, oh fuck, I'm going to find it. Uh, Nikolaj Arcel, um, who's done a couple movies with at this point, I think. Two, three... Uh, was that one? And he's wrote a couple that he did. Anyway, um, so this is set in the apparently it's like like it's a historical drama, but set like in um Norway, is it? Uh, Denmark. Sorry, fucking Ooh. confusing my European countries. Um, Denmark. Uh, but like yeah, during the like late seventeen hundreds soldiers kings whatever like that sort of stuff but i i mean i watched the trial and i was like you know what to be honest i have never seen a this time period anywhere other than like england or america you know what i mean mm. like so it sounds really interesting all reports are it's very good Mad, mads mickelson apparently gives a great performance of course um just <coughs> yes uh but very uh also, I want to point out that the film's original title, which uh, uh, is uh, Bastarden, just makes me, every time I say it, I go, <laughs> what? It's the film's title, Bastard? Anyway, no, it's not it's Bastard. But anyway, The Promised Land. Which is in right, cinemas well, currently. Yeah. In places. In places. Law system? TBD. All right, my number one, Boy Kills Worlds, the Bill Skarsgård leading action movie in which he's trying to get revenge on the people who killed his family in some sort of weird Hunger Games slash breakfast cereal commercial thing. Uh, I was just like super busy at the time, didn't get the chance to fetch out of cinemas, uh, but it is available digital at the moment, so I'm hoping to watch that at some point. So yeah. Yeah, no massive, you know. I feel like my list Things had more missed. like nuanced and you know. I don't know. I feel like Robot Dreams Acclaimed. was Academy nominated. Yeah. Right. And the Promised Land was submitted for Academy. I mean, I could have put Zone of Interest on my thing, but I'll be honest, I'm not really interested in seeing. <laughs> and your list is like, here's three five out of tens that I've watched this year. <laughs> <laughs> It's because I watched all the tens. <laughs> all of them. Now, what are your shout out? I put zero horror movies on there, you know? Because mm, yeah, you watched them all. It's true. I believe I have watched them all, other than um, stuff that is yet to come out. You know, like In a Violent Nature um, is out streaming on it's Shutter in too. America, but not not in Australia. So, you know, Cuckoo's not out here yet. Mm. All these other things. So. All right. Uh, I do this week. What do you want to watch? God fucking damn it. <laughs> you do it first. Uh, I mean, Bike Riders. Ah, that's my answer. I knew there was something I wanted to watch on Thursday that's out this week. Bike Riders, that's my answer too. Uh, it's gotten solid reviews. <laughs> Didn't do bad gangbusters box office in the US. Um, and I believe it's coming to, like, coming to digital like next week in the US. So 
What? Uh, what's, yeah, very short turnaround. So I was listening to a podcast um, yesterday where they were talking about, they said it's uh, it's one person really liked it, what the other person was like mixed on it, but they said it's like it's sort of the what'll make people love it or hate is just it's uh it sort of jumps around time a lot, Ooh. like long you know. So apparently yeah. it cuts backwards and forwards between Jodie Comer's character like talking and then like jumps forward in time. Or what, so. so if you can't handle uh, non non linear storytelling, yeah, or a woman talking, <laughs> or a woman talking. Uh, I mean, other big, uh, not much on the TV front this week, but there's a bunch of like movies. Obviously, we talked about Horizon Chapter One, that's coming to cinemas. Uh, Beverly Hills Cop, Axel F coming out, uh, and then The Imaginary, the uh, animated film, is coming to Netflix on Friday. Let us know what you want to watch this week by going to explosionwork dot com slash Twitter. Or jump into Discord at explosion.com slash Discord. If you want to help us out here at Whatever Watch, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts from Podchaser. Leave us five stars so you can leave five stars or just tell people about the show. And if you've enjoyed this episode, thought it was worth a dollar, head on over to our Kofi page at explosion at explosionnetwork.com slash support. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time, keep watching stuff, I guess. <laughs>